this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In December 1944, the Germans launched the Battle of the Bulge, their last major offensive in the West. Commencing in the depths of winter, with the hope that the weather would neutralise Allied air superiority, three German armies attacked through the Ardennes. I've looked at part of the Ardennes offensive before, but from the American perspective. In this episode, I'm joined by Anthony Tucker-Jones, and we're going to reverse the tables and look at the operation from the German point of view. Anthony has been with us before in episode 156, where we discussed Winston Churchill. And this time we're looking at his book, Hitler's War, the German Battle of the Bulge. Anthony, welcome back. Um, let's start with the, with the planning of the offensive. There had been somewhat of a, a rout across France for the Germans in the summer of 1944. Um, when did Hitler first consider uh, going on the offensive in the West? They are obviously under a lot of pressure in the East uh, uh, as well. Hitler decided pretty much after the, you know, the crushing of the German pocket of Falaise in Normandy that to regain the initiative Germany needed to conduct counteroffensives on the Western Front and indeed on the on the Eastern Front. And for me, I was always fascinated by a key point that's often overlooked with the Normandy campaign is that after the German collapse, an awful lot of them got away. There's always that row amongst, you know, the British, Canadians, the Poles and the Americans about not closing off that pocket, largely because of fear of friendly fire, which they did have, and also largely because the Germans fought so, you know, bitterly to keep, keep the mouth of the pocket open. So a large number of them got away. Not only did a large number of them got away, but there was a key engagement in the city of Rouen on the River Seine, which again goes overlooked in that the Germans conducted a pretty good rearguard action there, which enabled them to get a lot of troops over the river. Now, by that stage, the Allies had brought down most of the bridges, so they didn't get their heavy equipment over. Most of it was abandoned on the western bank. But the upshot was, of all the troops they lost, almost 100,000 members of the armoured divisions that they'd lost in Normandy escaped. I can't remember what the figure was uh, for early September 44 after the collapse. It's something like 100. They had like 100 panzers left in the West from, you know, thousands uh, at the height of the Normandy battle. So I was, all, I always saw, unfortunately, the Allies partly sowed the seeds for the Ardennes offensive by letting those panzer troopers escape. But also Hitler then conducted a quite remarkable holding action, um, obviously in the Low Countries and along the German frontier, while he rebuilt all of those panzer divisions that had escaped, re-equipped them, again, thanks to Albert Speer and the, you know, the, the German war weapons factories, which also showed how poorly the Allied uh, strategic bomber campaign was doing, because despite their best efforts, you know, munitions, guns, tanks, fighter aircraft were all pouring out of those factories. And in fact, in many instances, they had more equipment than the Germans could use. The problem the Germans always had was trained troops, trained pilots. That's, it wasn't so much a lack of equipment, but they were losing a war of human attrition, effectively. So that's kind of what intrigued me, is, is that all those men had got away. And also, of course, the Allies then got a bloody nose at Arnhem because that, you know, Monty's famous left hook over the, the Rhine went wrong. Uh, and in a way, that sort of invigorated the Germans a bit, gave them a bit of hope. Plus, they were holding the Rhine. There's a bitter battle with the Americans on the, on the German city of Aachen, which is the first German city to, to fall. And a lot of the Allies thought that the Germans launched a counteroffensive there because that was the obvious place to do it, to reclaim German soil. So while all this is going on, Hitler's rebuilding his forces fairly secretly, it has to be said. Although the Allies should have known, you know, all those men hadn't just vanished, that they were doing something. So he rebuilt all these um, all these Panzer forces, uh, and likewise, after the 20th of July 1944 bomb plot, Hitler did not trust the Wehrmacht, the armed forces, particularly the army, and therefore put increasing faith in the SS. So he put Heinrich Himmler, you know, Reichsführer SS, in charge of the German replacement army, which usually fed replacements into the uh, German army. 
He was placed in charge of regenerating Hitler's infantry divisions. And rather than send the new recruits to the old battered divisions, he created these new things called Volk's Grenadier Divisions or People's, uh, People's Grenadier Divisions. Smaller than infantry division, but with more firepower, they had more submachine guns, more machine guns, so it gave them a, a slightly more, more clout than they normally had. And he generated all these as well. So along with the Volks Grenadier divisions, some of the uh, reconstituted infantry divisions and those panzer divisions, he ended up with a very, very large strike force, which, um, as we know, ended up being uh, fifth and sixth panzer armies uh, supported by seventh army. So he had this, this really, really powerful panzer fist. But the thing that intrigued me from the German point of view was what was he going to do with it? We all know with the benefit of hindsight about the Battle of the Bulge, how it panned out, how the Germans eventually lost, you know, how Monty fell out with the American generals because he claimed he'd ridden to the rescue. Um, you know, we all know the narrative of Bastogne, St. Viz, you know, all those key battles in the Bulge. But for me, it was like, well, was, was the Battle of the Bulge Hitler's only option? So part of the book looks at what was known as the big or small solution which was what was Hitler going to do? Because what Hitler wanted to do was deliver such a bloody nose to the Allies, the British and the Americans, uh, that they would, ha- they would pause and it would prolong the war. And by doing that, if the Allies paused, he could then withdraw some of the troops on the Western Front to the Eastern Front and do exactly the same with the Red Army. He would deliver a large counterstroke against them uh, and that would buy him time. And he clung to the hope that the British and the Americans would fall out uh, with Joseph Stalin with the, with the Soviets and that there would become this, the rift and the, the grand alliance, both East and West would come apart. Now, as we know from you know, what we've seen in history, that was pretty much a pipe dream, but that's what he hoped. And also, even if he had a modicum of success, success both on the West and on the Eastern fronts, it would have prolonged the Second World War. I mean, essentially, you know, Nazi Germany by late 44 is fighting for its life. It's, you know, apart from Italy, where it's hanging on pretty well, Western and Eastern fronts are collapsing at a rapid rate. So he, he, he came up with this idea for a master stroke, which we all go, well, looking at the Battle of the Bulge was a completely foolish thing to do and a waste of all those resources that he'd uh, gathered. So he, he got his generals together and basically they had these, these two options, the, the, the big or the small. And the small one, as I, I mentioned earlier, was, was to retake the city of Achin, pinch off the American assailant there, create a pocket behind it and nab maybe up to a dozen American divisions. If they had done that, that then would have put them in hailing distance of Liège and the River Moose. And maybe if that had gone to plan, you could then have got to Antwerp. But Hitler didn't like to think small. So, of course, he actually had a big solution, which was to punch through the Ardennes, like they had done in 1940, but it must be said under completely different circumstances and conditions. But he had that in his mind that they could successfully catch the Americans by surprise, punch through the Ardennes, get to the River Moose, get over, cross at Namur and Liège, head for Antwerp, capture Antwerp or destroy it because it had only just come back online as a supply point for the Allies. And that would prolong the war because the Allies would be back to using the, you know, the Red Ball Express rolling all the way from Cherbourg and the other French ports across uh, northwest Europe to resupply the Allied armies. So that would have caused a major setback for the Allies, which in principle was a very sound idea. But Hitler's generals by this stage, of course, were well aware of what was going on on the ground, what the Wehrmacht was capable of and what it wasn't capable of, and therefore they favoured the small solution. But Hitler foolishly overrode them and said, no, we're going to go for the big solution, which is what then set in chain, obviously, the events of the Battle of the Bulge. People sort of forget that the Battle of the Bulge is actually only one of four operations that took place during that winter. So there are actually four other operations, as it turned out for Hitler, unfortunately unrelated to the Watch on the Rhine or Autumn Mist Battle of the Bulge. Unrelated, but he launched three other major operations that winter. Again, if you, if you know anything about the Battle of the Bulge, you know that the Luftwaffe was planning to launch a knockout blow against the Allied air forces during the winter. But again, for the Luftwaffe, it had two options. It supported the ground forces, or Adolf Garland, who was commanding uh, the German fighter forces. He favoured a knockout blow against the American Air Force, not a ground support uh, mass strike, uh, because he wanted to knock out as many American bombers as possible to cause a pause in the Allied strategic bomber campaign, which would give Nazi Germany a breathing space 
uh, and enable its factories to carry on doing what they're doing. Uh, also give its synthetic oil plants a breathing space, etc. So again, within the Luftwaffe, there were these two schools of thought. Well, once more, Hitler overrode them and said that they would go for Operation Bowden Plate or Base Plate, which would be launched against uh, the Allied Air Forces in northern France and in the Low Countries. Problem with that was it was only really useful for the Ardennes Offensive if it happened either before or during the Battle of the Bulge, which it didn't. It happened uh, pretty much two weeks after the ground offensive had started, by which time it was much too late to help. The second of the four operations was Hitler's intention to use his V weapons, the V1 and particularly the V2, uh, which he'd been using to bombard London in the vain hope that it would again upset our plans, stop us shipping uh, reinforcements and stuff over from the United Kingdom, or maybe pressure, I don't know, pressure Churchill into reconsidering. I, but it, but he was needlessly bombarding uh, London with the V2s. But he then decided to start using them on a tactical basis in which they would be used much shorter range and they would be used to bomb uh, bombard Brussels and particularly Antwerp, again, with a view to shutting those vital docks in Antwerp. As it was, again, if you're familiar with the V-weapon programmes, those weapons were notoriously inaccurate. So although he heavily bombarded Antwerp, it had no real impact on the port and likewise had no bearing on the ground fighting. And then your third operation, which was to be a subsidiary ground offensive called Operation Northwind or Nordwind, to be conducted in the Alsace, while the Ardennes offensive was recapturing Antwerp. It was, uh, Northwind was to deliver a blow against the Americans and the French further south by recapturing Strasbourg. Again, it was within their wit to do that. They had this Colmar pocket on the western bank of the Rhine so they could strike from there and from, from the north. But the problem with this offensive is it didn't draw the pressure off the back of the bulge because like base plate, it happened in the new year. So two weeks, in fact, more than two weeks, after the Ardennes offensive started. Now, you, you alluded to, you know, the, the Germans had gone through the Ardennes in 1940, but obviously that's, you know, four years has passed. What, um, what had changed in the Ardennes? Was, it, was, was the German army still as suited to go through the Ardennes? Or, or, or you know, were the Allies even, had they even considered the Ardennes? From, you know, it it stri- strikes me, you know, things have changed. Tanks have got bigger or, you know, Bridges might have gone or... That's a very good question because obviously Hitler looked at the Ardennes and went, it's a weak spot, we can get through and we'll do that right hook like we did in 1940, which, you know, as we know, enabled uh, the Germans to cut through to Abbeville and, you know, resulted in Dunkirk and the rest of history. So he wanted to repeat that because in, uh, in 1940, he did it in May, so in the spring, so the weather was friendly. You're right, the size of the panzers were different. And also, of course... The French army facing him was not battle-hardened, whereas at least a proportion of the American divisions of the Ardennes were. And also, of course, the Allies also had reserves that they could call on. So obviously you had Monty's 21st Army Group in the north uh, with a couple of armies that could spare troops to push south if they needed to. And likewise, of course, you have Patton's US 3rd Army uh, down to the south that had been fighting in the Lorraine, which again you know, had divisions, if need- needed, could actually be diverted north Onto the, onto the southern shoulder of the German breakthrough. So the conditions were completely different. Now, even in 1940, Hitler's generals said it's not possible. You know, that terrain is not good for panzers. The roads are poor, the bridges are poor. Uh, it's too forested, so it's not good tank fighting country. Again, he kind of overruled them, made them do it. And again, as we know, uh, they, they achieved this remarkable success there. But by the winter of 1944, of course, you've got bad weather. So there's snow. As you rightly pointed out, Hitler's using a new generation of tanks, which are a lot heavier, uh, principally, of course, the Panther tank and the Tiger tank, which are a lot heavier than early Mark III's and IV's that they'd used in 1940. And also the bridges and the roads had not got better in that time, of course. You know, there's a war on, so there's not been any public works instituted in that area. And one of the reasons that the German generals are against the Ardennes offensive was they had to get themselves over half a dozen rivers before they even reached the Moose. And you go, well, the German army was experienced in crossing rivers. If you you look at their success on the Eastern Front, uh, they did it with aplomb and without too much difficulty. But of course, again, by the winter of 1944, most of the German army's engineering bridging equipment had either been lost or was tied up on the Eastern Front. Because, of course, when they'd invaded the Eastern Front, the Russians, uh, understandably, had blown up most of the bridges. 
the Germans had used their engineering equipment temporarily until such time as they can build more uh, permanent structures out of timber, which they did. Of course, the winter then came along with the ice flows, which damaged a lot of the bridges. So the engineering equipment had to be broken out again. They would then rebuild the more permanent structures, by which time, of course, in the Eastern Front, the Partisan War was underway. And the Soviet partisans, of course, kept blowing them up. So, again, a lot of American engineering, you know, what we would call Bailey bridges or pontoon bridges, was tied up on the Eastern Front. So when it came to the Ardennes offensive, they simply did not have enough bridging equipment to get over the rivers. Bizarrely, uh, a lot of the bridging columns were actually equipped with timber to build bridges. Well, if you're engineers, building bridges is, you know, is, is what you do for a day job. But you tend to do that not under fire. The whole point of the Bailey bridges or pontoon bridges, those can be you know, erected if needs be under fire and got across quickly. But if you're building timber structures, of course, that takes time. You've got to have guys out in the rivers. You need pile drivers, all those kind of things. So how on earth Hitler thought that his engineers were going to be building wooden bridges you know, whilst fighting the Americans? Beggar's belief. But that was another one of the drawbacks that the Germans had. Uh, and again, as you, you rightly mentioned, earlier many of the bridges in that region of the world were single lane ones usually one or two span quite often dated from the middle ages so were not designed to take 40 odd ton tanks and therefore were likely to collapse the other thing is of course is that the germans had to take into account was that the americans as soon as they realized what was happening were going to demolish every single bridge in the ardennes that they could lay their hands on and indeed is what they did in a number of areas all of which, of course, would create bottlenecks for the German advance. And, of course, a lot of the German generals were very well aware of all these shortcomings before the operation was launched, which, you know, again, as I I explore in the book, hopefully through the generals. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a great believer in show, don't tell. So the story is told through the likes of Sepp Dietrich and uh, you know, von Mantufo and... um, Joachim Piper and Otto Skorzeny and all the key players, it, it, it's told through their eyes to try and explain how they saw the situation at the time. Because to be fair to them, they, they themselves, particularly Sepp Dietrich, were amazed when he was placed in charge of a brand new army, you know, Sixth Panzer Army, that had all these new new divisions. I was going to ask about Sepp, Sepp, Sepp Dietrich. He's, he's in charge of it all. It's, it's a bump up for him, isn't it, to be in charge of such a organization it's it's as you're right and he didn't want the job you know he really did not want the job and you have to remember of course that set dietrich was a friend of and right hand man of hitler's from the early days you know he'd been in charge of hitler's bodyguards back in the early 30s so he'd been there from the beginning after the war he tried to distance himself from hitler and you know to the little but you know hitler trusted him um because of the 20th of July 1944 bomb plot, Hitler had placed all his faith in his SS generals to deliver. And of course, on the Eastern Front, they had done that on a regular basis. Obviously, they were the ones that had achieved the victory at Arnhem. So he saw the Waffen SS, the armed SS, if you like, as a fire brigade. You know, wherever they went, they achieved what Hitler needed. Time and time again, you know, SS divisions have been used on the Eastern Front to cut their way through pockets of trapped German troops. Uh, they would do it and they would rescue them. So Hitler had high hopes for the SS on the Western Front in the winter of 44. So he, he turned to Sepp Dietrich. But the thing is, Sepp Dietrich, and I think Sepp Dietrich knew this, was a good divisional commander and not a bad corps commander, but he was not an army commander. So, of course, as you go up the food chain, the volume of responsibility you have gets bigger, you know, and you've got to be able to problem solve on a mass scale and be able to delegate. That's another important thing. So, of course, if you're a divisional commander, you've got a division with a couple of regiments, and that's not too bad. If you're a corps commander, you then control maybe two or three divisions. That's not too bad. But when you're commanding an army, of course, that's made up of multiple corps and 10 to 20 divisions. So the magnitude of the management job, if you like, is enormous. And Sepp Dietrich did not want the job obviously because Hitler had appointed him, he couldn't, he couldn't refuse it. But he was, A, he was not happy at getting the job, and B, he was certainly not happy at the Ardennes offensive. I go into some detail in the book about, you know, all the planning meetings they had, because after the war, Sepp Dietrich disingenuously claimed that he hadn't known until a few days beforehand, actually, as the, you know, the record of all the meetings shows, Dietrich was being economical with the truth. 
and the view is of that is because of course a lot of the generals after the war tried to save their own reputations by blaming Hitler constantly. You know, if you've read things like The Other Side of the Hill, you know, you're, you're fully aware that all the generals went, oh, it never worked from the start. We were against it. Um, you know, it was Hitler's fault. It was madness. And you kind of think, well, you always have to treat first under accounts with a pinch of salt because of the agenda. And you think, well, when they were talking to Basil Little Harp back in the, whenever it was, the 50s and 60s, they all had axes to grind. To be fair to them, they most of them were against it from the beginning because they knew what they were being asked to do was simply too much of a, of a tall order. Uh, but as I say, Sepp Dietrich claimed, oh, well, you know, my part of the operation went wrong because I didn't have time to plan for it. True. Uh, my part of the operation went wrong because I wasn't told in advance enough. And you kind of go, well, that's not entirely true because he'd been put in charge of 6th Panzer Army in the Achin area fairly early on, so knew something was afoot. Uh, he naturally assumed that he was going to conduct some sort of operation in the Achen area. Obviously, that then then shifted. So he was a bit disingenuous on on you know it wasn't my fault, Gov, because actually it was partly in parcel because he he just really wasn't up to the job. Do we know how comprehensive the planning was? Because obviously we we always focus on the Ardennes part of what is a bigger offensive that doesn't a lot of it doesn't pan out. So uh, you know. It, 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 it intrigued me that the fact that uh, you know you, you can point fingers at planning when we didn't have enough time to plan, um, or is it that they didn't plan the, the the parts of the plan that came to fruition were the pan, plan parts of the plan that didn't concentrate on because they were actually worrying about other parts of the a plan that they never got to uh, uh, tie myself up up in knots there. Um, <laughs> no, well, no, I think you've hit the nail right on the head in that as a as a as a general. It's your job to show initiative and delegate that initiative down through the ranks to problem solve. And the problem with the Ardennes was just the German commanders were faced with so many problems, they were unable to problem solve many of them at all. And, of course, they, they blame that on the lack of planning. But in a way, it was a lack of resources and flexibility in, in what they did. So you're right. When did planning start? Well, Hitler had decided he wanted to conduct a counteroffensive on the Western Front from pretty much September 44. So they had plenty of time to plan it. And pretty much from October onwards for, what, two and a half months, they re-kitted those armies. So again, it was all the planning for that. So there, there was an awful lot of planning um, done. The problem was, was that the Ardennes was not suitable really by, you know, as we've discussed, 44 for that type of armoured offensive, despite the masses of forces that they had. I mean, you know, we mustn't dismiss 5th and 6th Panzer Army. They were really well equipped. They had uh, elite SS divisions in there. OK, they were not, you know, they were a shadow of their former selves, but they still knew the business of fighting. But the problem was the plan was over ambitious. And also there was no flexibility. I mean, Hitler basically gave them two weeks you know it was a week to get to the moose and a week to, to land up there wasn't enough time and also hitler was too reliant on the weather his generals knew damn well clear skies meant allied fighter bombers and everything would come off the rails you know you'd have to hide up during the day uh, you couldn't move and uh, and hitler predicted a two week or at least his weather forecaster predicted and i think the man was given a gold watch as you remember i didn't include the story but when I was researching the, the weather side of it, the meteorologist who came up with said two weeks, you know, second half of December, you're fine. Hitler apparently gave the man a gold watch as a thank you. But again, as we know, actually that forecast proved wrong and it was a week. So they had a week. And also it's important to remember, although the weather was bad, both the US and the British Air Forces and indeed the Luftwaffe were not grounded all the time during that first week. You know, combat sorties were flown. We kind of have this popular conception that there was nothing going on in the sky. Well, that's not true. There were uh, limited numbers of sorties conducted, but not on the scale that could be done with clear skies. So, of course, Hitler's generals effectively had a week to get to the moose. I think, you know, because, again, certainly set Dietrich, I think the others felt if they got to the river, if they got to the moose, honour was served. You know, they weren't going to get to Antwerp. It wasn't doable. But if they got to the river, it would give Hitler the victory he needed or a partial one and honour would be served. Um, so they had this race against time before the, before the weather lifted. The Luftwaffe was not really in a condition to take on Allied Air Forces in a head-to-head -head fight. 
even though it was quite powerful. Part and parcel, again, was the fact that Luftwaffe was unable to blaze a trail for the Panzers as, a, as they advanced. And, of course, crucially, although some American units acted quite shamefully and ran away when the, when the fighting started, a lot of them did the opposite and dug their hills and then stayed put. So at places like St. Viv and Bastogne, American resistance there completely derailed uh, the German timetable because it, 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 it not only slowed everything up, it caused the most terrible bottlenecks, which meant you had different armoured units competing for the same roads and chaos. And, of course, once the weather cleared, the last thing you wanted was great long columns of armoured vehicles and half-tracks and lorries and what have you, uh, strung out along roads that were sure, you know, easy meat for American Mustangs and, you know, Thunderbolts and all the rest of it that, that set about them. His generals were well aware, I think, from the beginning that there were limitations um, that they could only achieve so much. I mean, ultimately, it boiled down to how quickly the Allies were going to react. And again, I think Hitler, you know, grossly underestimated the Americans. They didn't place much stock in their fighting abilities. You know, he felt that it was a massed conscript army, uh, particularly by that stage, was fighting on a broad front. You know, Eisenhower wasn't showing any flair. At least Montgomery had had a go at hooking over the Rhine. You know, afterwards, Eisenhower sort of, you know, had, had his feet burned, so he didn't, he just went, well, we're going to advance along the entire German frontier and that's the end of it and we'll grind them down. You know, it wasn't very imaginative. So Hitler had a dim view of the German divisions, plus, of course, a lot of those that were in the Ardennes had literally just arrived in Europe. I mean, they were greenhorns. They, you know, brand new units, didn't know the business of fighting. Did the Germans know what they faced? Did they know what was opposite them in the Ardennes? Because it is a funny mix of new green units and actually shattered vet- veteran units that are reforming. You're right. They they had some idea. I mean, obviously, it was the American army. Uh, and I think they appreciated that the Ardennes, because the Allies didn't think that Germans broke through, there was a quiet sector and therefore was being used as a rest and, rest and recuperation area, you know, that combat units pulled out the line could go there to, to re-kit and rest up and go on leave and furlough and all the rest of it. And also it was a good place to put new divisions because they were behind the lines, you know, they could get acclimatised to the European weather and, you know, get all their cold weather kits sorted and all that sort of thing. But famously, one of the generals did, did say, you know, what am I going to face? And they were like, well, you'll know when you get there. So again, their level of it, their level of information was poor. And that was illustrated by the fact that the Luftwaffe would not fly any reconnaissance flights over the Ardennes to the army because it was planning this big grand slam, um, sort of big fist airstrike against the Allied um, airfields in in Northern Europe. It didn't want to to give away its hand by conducting too many reconnaissance flights. Uh, So much to the annoyance of the German army, it didn't get any uh, photographs or maps which for any operation you need, you need to know exactly what's in front of you, what to expect, you know, where the key points of resistance are, all those sorts of things. So they got very, very little intel in the run up to launching the offensive. The irony is that certain uh, general reconnaissance planes had already been flying wreckies to the bridges, but they simply did not share the intelligence they had, you know, in part because it was rivalry between the services. Um, and as I say, and also because the Luftwaffe, didn't want to give away its hand because it was planning its own operation, unfortunately, pretty much completely separate from the ground offensive. You know, the, the Allies enjoy massive air superiority. Did the uh, Luftwaffe have any uh, plan how they were going to counter that as, as an air umbrella over the advancing forces, or were they just not expecting to do that? Were they expecting their operation to be so decisive that the Allies would have nothing left to put up? Well, initially, obviously, they were hoping that the two-week two bad weather would keep much of the Allied air forces grounded. And also, the, the Germans knew that the airfields to hit were not so much the forward airfields that the Allied uh, fighters and bombers were operating from, because a lot of those would be inoperable come the bad weather. The airfields they needed to hit were the ones that they had previously been occupying because they had concrete runways. So they knew that a lot of the satellite airfields outside the major towns, particularly outside um, Brussels, were good. You know, they had hangars, they had accommodation blocks for the air crew and all the rest of it. But importantly, they had hard standing taxi areas and concrete runways. So those were the ones that they were going to hit. But again, with the German... um, Air offensive didn't happen for two weeks until after the ground forces operation started. With that, again, the Germans miscalculated because the obsession was 
to keep the Allies off the ground forces, they would knock out as many Allied aircraft as possible. Well, with that, they're on a hiding to nothing because they're fighting a, an air war of attrition then. And their plan was that they would pounce on the Allied airfields in the early hours and destroy as many aircraft on the ground as possible. Sounds like a sound plan, which it was. They would catch them on the hop and they would destroy as many aircraft as possible. But the problem with that, of course, was they ignored the massive industrial muscle that the Allies had in the didn't matter how many planes you destroyed, they would replace them and fairly quickly. What they should have done, of course, which has gone for those airfields infrastructure, so destroyed the hangars, destroyed the accommodation, and where possible, killed the ground crew, you know, bombed accommodation. Because what they actually needed to do was kill pilots and ground crew. They were the valuable things. You know, if you're looking at your air forces as assets, your human elements, the vital bit, you know, they're the ones that keep the aircraft flying, they're the ones that fly it, and particularly with the pilots, they're going to be the ones that have got combat experience. But the Germans got it in their heads, and I suspect from pressure from Hitler, that the plan was destroy as many fighters as you can on the ground, which they did. They destroyed quite a lot. But as I say, all this, of course, took place on the 1st of January, uh, weeks after the Ardennes Offensive started. But the problem with that was, then what did the German fighters do when they are on their way home? Because by that point, they had stirred up a hornet's nest. And, of course, the surviving fighters would be on their tails. So they still ended up with air battle. And also the Germans did the attack in two waves. And, of course, when the second wave came in, the Allies were well alert to what was happening and, of course, intercepted them. Also, in some cases, of course, the Allies, particularly the Americans, already had standing, standing patrols. Uh, there was one American squadron leader, I think the squadron leader, who on New Year's Eve had, had refused to allow his pilots to have a celebratory drink because he didn't want them with hangovers in the morning because he just had this feeling that maybe come the new year, the Germans might try something. So he wanted his pilots fresh for the following day, which, of course, for him was good because, again, the Germans had gambling that, you know, the American PX that uh, sort of, you know, stores would crack out, you know, turkey dinners and beer and all the rest of it for all the guys. So they would be really stuffed and full of alcohol the following morning and therefore not at their best. But what actually the Luftwaffe ended up doing was wasting an awful lot of experienced pilots and a lot of new ones because they had to scrape bop the barrel to come up with enough pilots for this. I mean, it was supposed to be a thousand aircraft attack. And what they did do was they stripped a lot of their training facilities of the instructors, who are guys that you don't need, you, you shouldn't lose, because they've probably already seen combat on the Western and most certainly on the Eastern fronts and probably over Germany, you know, defending the right from the Allied bomber campaign. So the instructors were highly experienced individuals. A lot of them, to be fair, were chafing at the bit to have another go, so we're quite happy to climb in the cockpit. But of course, if you lost them, they were irreplaceable, which then meant your training school suffered and your flow of fresh pilots was hampered. So, you know, there were a myriad of different factors that the Germans had to take into account, which on the whole they tended to ignore, mainly, of course, because they were gambling that this would buy them a, a breathing space. Well, wasn't sure if they'd also believed their own sort of hype in some, you know, the wonder weapons with the, you know, the, the ME 262s coming online. And I wondered if they thought that was some sort of force multiplier that they would just bat the Allies out of the air. Well, again, I, I do go into that in, in, in the book, you know, I think it's a title, chapter called um, Bomber Not a Fighter or something. And I, and I look at the Messerschmitt 262, which, of course, is the one that most people are familiar with, uh, you know, the, the first ever jet fighter. But actually, Hitler had up to half a dozen jet fighter and bomber programs on the go and had they been ready by the winter you're right they would have been a force multiplier because of course they could outrun most allied aircraft but during the development program in the summer of 44 hitler got it into his head that the 262 should be a fighter bomber and not a fighter and of course the luftwaffe really wanted it as a fighter as an interceptor again to stop allied bombers you know it could outrun the mustangs uh, it would shoot at the bombers and it could then fly to safety. So it would be a real nuisance in that role. But Hitler decided it would be a fighter bomber you know, to blaze a path for the German army. But, of course, that meant putting different structural stresses on the airframe. It then led to a row between Hitler and the Luftwaffe because the um, programme manager kind of ignored Hitler and pressed on with the fighter programme. When Hitler found out, he was furious and insisted. So they ended up building two sorts. All that slowed down production, so it meant... By the winter of 44, there weren't very many available. And I was horrified to see that the few that were available actually were used as policemen to patrol the, uh, you know, Operation Base Plate, the Grand Slam air attack on the Allies' air forces. They were used to patrol them to make sure that no German pilot shirked 
his his duty. Uh, and it's the same with the Aredo bomber. They had limited numbers of jet bombers, which again were really, really fast, but they simply did not have enough of them to make enough of an impact. But I say a lot of these jet programs were a result of infighting, mission creep. You know, we know that today. British MOD is always in trouble because it's got a program online and then mission creep creeps in. You know, they change the parameters of what they want to do. Well, the Germans were constantly, you know, victims of that with a lot of their highly advanced weapons programs. You know, I mean, those jet aircraft programs were well ahead of their time. And if they'd been ready in time, obviously would have made uh, a great difference. There was also a, uh, forgive me, I'm going from memory, I think something like the Volks bomber. So they were going to do a people's bomber. And the idea was it could be flown by Hitler youth or, or, or you know, inspired young Nazis as a single seat attack aircraft. And again, that could have been used during the Battle of the Bulge, but it was simply not ready. You know, you had things, um, 163, I think, the Comet, again, high-speed high interceptor designed to attack Allied bombers, but the thing, that, the fuel the thing used made it a death trap, you know, that they tended to explode on takeoff or on landing. You know, it had to take off using a, a, a little set of skids, you know, which it dropped. So landing the thing was a complete nightmare. So they had all these things, which, of course, under peacetime, you can iron out all those uh, developmental programs. But, of course, they were doing these this under wartime conditions all the time. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the jet program, along with the V V program, actually, if it had reached maturity, could have had quite a significant impact or, on the Battle of the Bulge. I think particularly the 262, the irony is for the Battle of the Bulge is Hitler was spot on because what the German army needed was a fighter bomber that could be called up to blast away, you know, like they used to do with the Stuka, which by this stage was too slow, but like they used to do the Stuka, the JU-87, it would turn up and it would bomb anything in front of the army into oblivion and they would press on. So for the for the Ardennes offensive, the 262 would have could have been ideal as a fighter bomber. But ironically, because of the infighting over you know what was its role, there weren't there weren't enough available. I do wonder if the Luftwaffe's biggest contribution to the, the Ardennes offensive turns out to be actually boots on the ground rather than uh, planes in the sky. Yeah, you're right. I mean, 5th Parachute Division, which belonged to the Luftwaffe, I mean... I don't want to overpraise them, but, you know, they, they fought remarkably, quite frankly, uh, at the Ardennes because they ended up being tasked with trying to take Bastogne and fend off Patton's, you know, US Third Army when it turned up to relieve Bastogne. So poor old Fifth Parachute ended up find, fighting on two fronts. I mean, they were decimated. They really, they really were. But for a while, they fought heroically. But again, they fought a battle of attrition where they simply ran out of manpower and, and equipment. So, yes, there were... I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, there were uh, two or three, I think, parachute divisions that, that were involved. But, but again, but you see, that, that was part of the infighting. You know, um, the Luftwaffe ended the war. Goring ended, Hermann Goring ended the war with a dozen parachute divisions. And you go, well, why wasn't... They weren't being used for airborne ops, so why were they not given to the German army? The Luftwaffe also ended up with... A, Again, I can't remember. I think it's about uh, 30-odd Luftwaffe field divisions because they had so much manpower. And you go, well, logically, those divisions should have been given to the army. I mean, it, it, in the end, they were. But what it meant was the army inherited these Luftwaffe field divisions that were in a, inadequately equipped, in a, inadequately trained and led to fight its infantry divisions, by which time the damage was done. Whereas if, you know, Goring had agreed and given them uh, the manpower at the start, they'd gone through infantry training and been reassigned to existing divisions, that would have been brilliant. It meant the Luftwaffe had basically 40, you're right, ground divisions that were denied the army. Uh, you know, you, you can make the same accusation with the Waffen SS. I mean, they ended up with, what, almost 40 divisions, uh, of which half a dozen probably were any good, you know, were really good fighters. Most of the others were complete disaster areas. Uh, but what it meant was that you had 40 divisions, which once again were denied the army. You know, it was all this Hitler's divide and rule tactic amongst amongst the armed forces, which, you know, as we've discussed as the war progressed, got worse. You know, because Hitler went, my God, the army's tried to kill me and probably the Luftwaffe's in on it. And yeah, uh, and, and the Luftwaffe, the, the Waffen SS, because they're, you know, ardent Nazis, uh, they're loyal to me. So... Um, I'll put increasing faith in them, which is, of course, what he did. When, when does it go wrong? What you know? What point do they? You know, is it is it lost on the opening day? When when, when is the uh, 
the point where it's not going to work, the Ardennes offensive? They've got almost to the moose. So to, to be fair to them, some of the commando units under, you know, which form part of Otto Senni's uh, 150 uh, Panzer Brigade, you know, which, which was you know, famously designed to dress as Americans and sow chaos as they went forward. And they were also um, supported by commando groups, which again were, were, were dressed as Americans. They did quite well. Certainly the commando units, uh, they did sow some chaos uh, and some of them actually got to the river. Panzer Brigade 150 actually turned out as a disaster because of the chaos on the roads. It didn't end up in front of the advance um, and they eventually ended up abandoning their American uniforms on the whole and fighting as infantry. So that so that, that didn't work. But the opening phase of the operation was quite successful and it took the Americans really by surprise. You know, American intelligence had been warning for quite a while that there was a build-up in that general area and that they needed to, to, to watch it. Something was brewing. But actually that... You know, that attack on 16th of December really caught the Americans by surprise. They cut through them quite quickly. There was chaos, you know, American units fled or were simply overwhelmed. You know, the the, the bulk of those units, in the, to be fair to them, in the Ardennes were infantry divisions. Most of them had an assigned tank battalion or tank destroyer battalion. But, you know, you put an infantry division up against the Battle Heim and Panzer Division that knows what it's doing, uh, they're fairly easy meat, which of course is is what happened. And as as we discussed earlier, Hit was hoping that most of the Americans would drop their arms and flee, uh, and certainly some of them shamefully did. But of course, when it came to St. Viers and Bastogne, they basically dug their heels and and went no. And really, the failure to take Bastogne signals that it's it's a disaster because Bastogne was that you know it's a, a root hub; all the roads go through there. And all the time that the Americans were sitting on it, it didn't matter how far the Germans advanced. They'd have this fortified town in their rear, which would be shelling their supply lines. And again, it goes back to the weather, because once the weather cleared, it didn't matter if the Germans surrounded the garrison. Once the weather cleared, the Americans would drop supplies to them, which, of course, indeed is, is what happened. And, of course, uh, if you've studied the battle, as you know, actually, it was touch and go for the Americans. You know, they were beginning to run out of ammo and food. It was getting to a point where it might look like their perimeter defence would crack. And then the weather lifted, you know, and the Americans just did this mass airlift and, and dropped in tons and tons of supplies. And that and that gave them a breather until such time as, as Patton turned up and, you know, cut a corridor up from the south. So big chunks of it. Uh, did did go well. It was just the timetable and also the terrain. You know, the terrain in the Ardennes is, is, is it's basically mountains. You know, it's, it's, it's wooded mountains. So, the, the the when the Germans did it in 1940, of course, they largely did it without any opposition in front. Of, famously, their main problem was traffic control. You know, they, you you needed your military police, your you know your guys with the metal gorgettes stood at road junctions, keeping everything moving, and that was their main problem. Whereas, of course, in the winter of 44. The Americans were resisting. The, the weather was appalling, particularly once the snow started to mount. mount you know, uh, and, and for the Panzers, of course, snow was a disaster because from the air, vehicles leave tracks, telltale signs. So even if you get your tanks under the trees out of the way and hide, once the weather cleared, the American fighter bombers and, and indeed uh, British and Commonwealth pilots would look at the road and you go, well, there's a track leading off that road through that snow-covered field into the woods, so we'll attack the woods. Whereas quite often, actually, if the weather's not too bad, you might get away with it. But most of us have seen lots of those aerial photos of the Ardennes after the weather lifted. And you can just see, you know, column of column of vehicles. Uh, you can see tracks everywhere. So um, long answer to your short question about is, is it, it went really well at the start. Uh, they over, of course, they overwhelmed St. Viv, so they had a success there. But they s- simply couldn't crack Bastogne. And all the time the Americans held Bastogne, it was a distraction. You know, uh, and also, of course, fuel. I mean, we've not discussed that, but basically the Germans are going to have to live off the land. Well, I thought the fuel was, uh, it, 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 it's telecephalus, isn't it, that uh, that uh, solved the, the Americans, <laughs> denied them the, the, the Germans getting the fuels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please don't reference that awful movie. <laughs> Although, like, I'm sure... That, like me, most of us grew up on that. Didn't we? You know, so. it, it was one of my favourite war films as a kid. And as a child, as soon as it started snowing as a child, I was out in the snow playing Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> the, those famous shots of the Panzers charging across the Spanish plains in sunshine. Yeah, so, um, well, it, 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 was a, it was a point I actually made, I was going to ask it right at the start, you know, the, 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 the film centres round fuel and 
Telus Savalis denying the Germans' fuel. And, and, and sort of out of secret I was going to say at the start, did the Germans actually make any allowance for their potential lack of f- fuel or, or, or is the film just talking nuts? No, uh, you're right. Um, the, the Germans essentially had enough for a certain operating period and then they were going to run out. And then that was reliant on their guys bringing up supplies by lorry. But of course, once the weather cleared, that would then become a real issue. I always have a fairly dim view on the um, Allied strategic bomber campaign. I mean, I think it was an appalling waste of human life. Uh, flattening cities willy-nilly is morally wrong, however you look at it. And as we've discussed, you know, it wasn't really affecting the German war effort late in '44. In fact, Albert Speer had told Hitler that they would run out of raw materials before they lost their factories. So, so that, actually, in terms of the strategic bomber campaign and point blank, the thing that actually began to hurt was hitting Germany's synthetic oil plants and also, of course, the oil fields in Hungary and Romania, um, which were supplying him until the Russians overran them. That actually is what began to hurt. You know, going back to our discussion about Luftwaffe, the Luftwaffe were beginning to run out of uh, aviation fuel. I mean, I think I mentioned in the book when they were doing their trials with the 262, they were so short of fuel, they were manoeuvring the aircraft out onto the taxi runways using horses. They didn't have fuel for the for the lorries. You know, they, they were just in a, and I think they're okay on aviation fuel, but vehicle fuel they were, you know, they were beginning to run out. So, but one of the key things the bomber campaign did do was it helped thwart the Battle of the Bulge because the Allied bombers were hitting places like Cologne and elsewhere, which were key railway junctions. So the Germans had a lot of stuff stockpiled east of the Rhine, ready to come over to resupply their armies fighting in the Ardennes. But increasingly, those rail yards were bombed into oblivion, which meant they couldn't get the trains in, they couldn't move the trains forward, uh, which meant increasingly what was left, they were having to truck forward, which took a lot longer and, of course, was more exposed. So going back to your point, they only had a certain amount of fuel to last them on operations. They had problems, obviously, behind the lines because the Allies were bombing um, their fuel supplies and ammo and everything else behind them. Uh, and of course, famously, you know, Sikkim SS simply ran out of fuel. You know, it, it, a lot of them simply ran out of fuel. Uh, of course, they famously missed a number of American uh, fuel dumps. You know, uh, Joachim Piper and his his first SS Panzer battle group. I mean, they suffered the same fate. They ran out of fuel. I mean, it's a appalling state of affairs that part and parcel of it was American resistance, uh, Allied air power intervention but also crucially fuel. I mean, they just, it's an appalling situation to be in that they ran out of fuel. Quite a lot of the guys survived, but they, they simply had to work their way back to German lines on foot. You know, they abandoned everything. Again, you know, we were discussing sort of new weapons, wonder weapons earlier. It, it, it's sort of the allied obsession with the Tiger tank. And of course, the Tiger II, the King Tiger or the Royal Tiger was assigned to Piper's um, uh, battle group. Uh, and the Tiger had been developed as a as a breakthrough tank. It was a heavy tank designed to help you break through enemy lines, uh, and then your lighter tanks would follow after it. So, in concept, it was sound. Using it in the Ardennes made no sense whatsoever. I mean, the thing weighed forty five tons. Fantastic gun on it. You know, it would kill anything. Brilliant gun on it. But you're putting a very heavy tank in the close close confines of forests where the gun is negated because you can't see your targets uh, and the bridges won't take its weight. I mean, so first it says battle group were given a battalion of things and uh, Joachim Piper just decided that they were, you know, a liability. I mean, he kept them in reserve because there was no way that they were going to spearhead his attack. And in fact, uh, most of them ended up abandoned around, I think, La Glise, again, for want of fuel. But of course, for the Allies, the Tigers were quite good because, of course, you know, Allied troops, Americans and British and Everyone else always used to get sort of tiger fear. You know, they always considered every single German panzer a tiger, which often they weren't. But, you know, what it meant was you had a large number of panzers and equipment just simply abandoned for want of fuel. It wasn't that the Allies destroyed them. It was just that they conked out. That is the end of the film, isn't it? The end of end of the Battle of the Bulge. It sort of is that helicopter shot of Paul's back of the road to the German army walking, walking home is the end of their film. How does Hitler explain the failure of what is essentially his plan? He's, his fingerprints are all over it. He was the one that sort of insisted upon this uh, huge offensive. How, how does he explain the failure? Uh, well, he didn't. I think, you, you, you know, as we all know, Hitler spent 
spent from what, you know, mid-43 to the end of the war in denial, you know, so from pretty much Kursk, you know, so beforehand you've had Tunis, North Africa, quarter of a million men lost. You've had Stalingrad, quarter of a million men lost. Uh, and you've had Kursk, where I think these days people think it wasn't such a fantastic Red Army victory that it was. You know, there's a lot of debate on numbers numbers knocked out and, and all the rest of it. But the, but the, but that aside, the important thing with Kursk was, of course, it ripped the heart out of the, the German Army's offensive capabilities. I mean, that, you know, you, you can count panzers till you're blue in the face if you want. And argue over who did what but the, but the essential point was it destroyed his, destroyed his offensive capability so from that point on they were pretty much on the defensive so from that point on Hitler's pretty much in denial you know his generals know that it's now a steady war of attrition um, and they need themselves out of the war so the failure of the Battle of the Bulge of course Hitler kind of did his classic ostrich routine and stuck his head in the sand because of course he had north winds down the south being commanded by Himmler, so he had high hopes that, that actually that would work. Of course, he also had base plate, the air offensive. He also clung to the hope that the V weapons offensive would work. But also, crucially, the minute the Battle of the Bulge came to an end, Set Dietrich and Sixth Panzer Army, which was then redubbed uh, significantly Sixth SS Panzer Army, because there's often quite a bit of confusion as to whether it was Sixth SS Panzer Army in in the Ardennes, and I do make a point in the book saying, no, it wasn't, because it had so many army divisions in it, it was only sixth. I mean, I think, um, I can't remember which general explains that, but one of them made it clear. But Sepp Dietrich found 6th Panzer Army, pulled out the line immediately, redubbed 6th SS Panzer Division, uh, sorry, Panzer Army, and sent to Hungary to launch a major counteroffensive against the Red Army there. So again, Hitler had high hopes that that would work. So he had a lot going on, in the wake of the, what essentially was a disaster, really, with, with the Battle of the Bulge. Because, again, he'd wasted all those forces. I mean, one of the other options that we didn't discuss earlier, you know, he had the big or the small option, but the other option, which was favoured by most of his senior generals, particularly Hans Gudurin, who's uh, chief of staff by that point, was that those reconstituted armies be used to defend the Rhine uh, and, and the Oder. They've got all that firepower. Let's make the British and Americans pay to get over the Rhine and the Russians to get over the Oder, or if not the Vistula. And also that was a good idea, because you put those armoured forces the other side of the Rhine, every time the Allies got over, you would launch a counterattack. You know, so you, you, you smash their bridgeheads. So actually that, you know, we should have discussed that, I guess, that at the start. That, that was his other major option, which most of his generals favoured, that, that they husbanded those panzer armies as a, as a, major, as a major reserve. He, he didn't do defensive battles, though, did he? The, the, I think the problem Hitler always had was that he was, he was um, blinded by, by the success of the German Blitzkrieg. We kind of forget how all-encompassing it was, that what it achieved is remarkable. You know, in military terms, it beggars belief, doesn't it? You know, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Norway, uh, France, you know, uh, Yugoslavia, Greece. I mean, it, it's just a great chunk of European Russia. I mean, what it, it, uh, the Baltic states, you know. And you can counter that with his static experience of the First World War, which is a defensive battle. So, you know, w w in his mind, you've got, you, you, he's tainted by sitting in trenches and slowly being whittled away, as opposed to, let's be aggressive. He, he still very much was of that mindset that uh, winning wars is about seizing ground. But of course, by the beginning of the Second World War, warfare had, it was mobile, very, very mobile. You know, it was almost back to the old days of where cavalry dominated the battlefield because you had Gudurian, de Gaulle, actually, to a certain extent, and other German generals, von Toma, from their experiences in Spain. They realised what the tank could do, you know, because as you're probably aware, at the beginning of the Second World War, was that school of thought, wasn't it? Is it an infantry support weapon? You know, so does it help the infantry get through? Or actually, do the infantry support the tanks? You know, which is it? Infantry support weapon or the infantry support the tanks? And of course, the Germans very quickly realised that the Panzer was a breakthrough weapon, that you would sweep forward, break through enemy lines. Once their defence is broken, then their defence is incoherent. Your infantry divisions then move up behind and mop up, which, of course, is what they did time and time again. You know, in the Eastern Front, they captured millions of Red Army prisoners trapped in all these pockets with no hope of relief, so they would simply surrender. So... Hitler's mindset was, as I say, was really 39 to, to 42 when 
it, it was maneuver warfare. And, and during the second second part of the Second World War, it still was maneuver warfare. But of course, the Allies had learned important lessons from the Germans uh, and had the military uh, well, not, the military the industrial muscle to implement it. That you know they could they could use the same tactics and conduct an attritional war and replace stuff. I mean, to my mind, always the apocryphal point was uh, North Africa with Kasserine, you know, where the Americans famously got a bloody nose at the hands of Rommel, lost loads of equipment, and guys captured, looked like a disaster for the Americans. And Rommel was horrified that the Americans were repl- able to replace much of their lost equipment overnight, you know, because American industry was just churning out this stuff 24-7 all the time, uh, and Germany simply could not compete. I've, it's not something I've looked at, but I keep meaning to look at it. It is just the more of these American industrial topics because they're always fascinating. I mean, you look at Higgins, some provincial little boat maker, and he becomes one of the biggest industries in America by the end of the war. And then, funnily enough, I think he goes it, it, the whole block goes pop within a few years after the war. It just, there's no army to feed, but he was tremendously successful. Yeah, you think Higgins' boat made all the Pacific landings, D-Day possible, you know. Uh, simple design, easy to build. Um, same with the Liberty ships. You know, the Americans were able to move troops and supplies globally uh, pretty easy because they were turning out Liberty ships at, at a rate that I find hard to believe. I mean, it's just incredible. Well, as we wander away from the Battle of the Bulge, shall we, shall we leave it there? Thanks, Anthony. Loyal listener, if you want to know more about the fighting in the Ardennes in 1944, the book is Hitler's Winter War the German Battle of the Bulge. As ever, I will put a link on the website, www.podcast.com. Patrons of the podcast, I have no doubt there will be more of Anthony and I chatting, so keep your eyes out for that. If you are not already a patron, you can sign up at patreon.com slash www.podcast. A dollar or so from listeners like you, does help me find the time to put the show together. So that's patreon.com slash www2podcast. So for now, that's all from me. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. Darling, that can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.